Good morning and welcome to All Souls. This Sunday until the 2nd of January, we're going to do something slightly different with these online services that we hope you'll really appreciate and want to be part of. You will know that 2021 is the 100th anniversary of the birth of John Stott, who was rector here for many years and used in the Lord's work all across the world. And so for five of the Sundays, uh, or Christmas as well, we're going to be reaching back into the archive and we will be listening to sermons preached by John Stott across his decades of ministry, Christmas sermons. Um, you can, of course, still listen to what we are actually saying here at All Souls. They'll be recorded and be up in our resources library as normal, but a lot of them will be carol services, and we thought this would be a great way of serving you and of introducing you to some of the rich material we have in our archive from the past. So let me read a verse from our Bible reading as we begin. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, and we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And in just a second I'm going to read our Bible reading, but I'm going to begin with the traditional Church of England prayer for an Advent carol service. So let's pray together. Beloved in Christ, be it in this Advent season our care and delight to hear again the message of the angels and in heart and mind to go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass and the babe lying in a manger. First let us pray for the needs of the whole world, for peace on earth and goodwill among all his people, for unity and brotherhood within the church he came to build. And because this of all things would rejoice his heart, let us remember in his name the poor and helpless, the cold, the hungry and the oppressed, the sick and them that mourn, the lonely and the unloved, the aged and the little children, all those who know not the Lord Jesus, or who love him not, or who by sin have grieved his heart of love. So may the Almighty God bless us with his grace. Christ give us the joys of everlasting life, and unto the fellowship of the citizens above, may the King of angels bring us all. Amen. Our reading is taken from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony, to bear witness to the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me and from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. 
the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. The first 18 verses of the Gospel of John are arguably the most profound statement anywhere in the New Testament about the Incarnation, about how God became a human being in Jesus of Nazareth. And we've been seeing in these recent weeks that in this uh, prologue to the Gospel of John, Jesus is given four different titles. He is called the Word, he is called the Light, this morning the topic was the Life, and the fourth one is the Son, the only begotten of the Father, or as it may be translated simply, the One and Only. Moreover, because this has been our theme, through Christ, the Word, God has become audible. Through Christ the light, God has become visible. Through Christ the life, God has become tangible. And through Christ the Son, God has become knowable. You see, the whole prologue of the Gospel of John presupposes that God himself in his innermost being, is invisible, inaudible, intangible, that he himself in his infinite perfection is way beyond the reach of our five senses. He is, in fact, inaccessible to us, or would be if it were not for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has made him accessible to us. Jesus Christ has brought him near to us so that we may know him and see him for ourselves. Now I wonder if you've ever noticed in the prologue to John's Gospel a very important thing that happens in verse 14. Because what happens at that point is a deliberate, abrupt change of pronoun. The first 13 verses of John chapter 1, and by the way, I hope you may have found the place by now in your Bible, in page, uh, on page 87 of the New Testament section. The first 13 verses are all in the third person singular or the third person plural. Just glance at it very quickly at the very beginning. In the beginning was the word the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Then He was in the world, and then He came unto His own people, and His own people did not receive Him. It's all He, He, and they, they. It's all in the third person, singular or plural. And suddenly with verse 14, we have the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and of his fullness have all we received. Three times we have the first person, plural, we and us. Now that's very significant. John deliberately moves from the past to the present, from history to experience from what happened 2,000 years ago to what it is possible can happen today in our own lives. What does God want our relationship to Jesus Christ to be like? I've no idea what many of you, what position many of you are in, but supposing you believe in the Incarnation, supposing you accept this fantastic truth that in Jesus of Nazareth God has become a human being. Suppose you believe the carol that says he came down to earth from heaven. You believe that. Then you ask, so what? It happened 2,000 years ago. It's ancient history. What has it got to do, what has it got to do with us? Isn't it of antiquarian interest only? How can we be involved 
in an event that took place nearly two millennia ago. Now that is the question that is behind this prologue. And John answers our unspoken questions in my text, in verses 14 and 16, in two verbs that he uses. Please look at the text if you kindly will. John 1 verse 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we have beheld His glory. We've seen something of His glory with our own eyes, though through the eyes of the evangelists, who were themselves the eyewitnesses. And then verse 16, From His fullness have we all received. Let me bring verse 14 and 16 together again more simply. What it says is this. First, we have seen his glory. And second, we have received his grace. There is something that we have seen in Jesus. And there is something that we have received from Jesus. That has been a life-changing experience for those who have come into it. Indeed, this is the very essence of Christmas as it concerns us. Will you think about those things for a few more minutes with me? First, we have seen his glory. Oh, I hope that you can say that. I think I can say it with full conviction. We have seen his glory. You know, glory is a very important biblical word. I doubt if we can understand the message of the Bible if we don't understand the meaning of the word glory. The best definition of it that I've ever heard was given by a former curate of this church way back in the 1930s who later became Bishop of Winchester, John V. Taylor. He said glory, the Greek word doxa, is the outward shining of the inward being of God. Because God's inward being is invisible and unknowable. All we can ever see or know of God is the outward shining of the inward being. And that is the glory of God. He's rather like the sun. Just as we cannot look at the sun. On a sunny day when there are no clouds, we cannot look directly at the sun without blinding ourselves. But we can see the sunshine. We can see the effulgence of the sun. We can look at the world in the light of the sun. Just so we cannot look on God. Nobody has ever seen God. If we were to see God directly, we would wither up and be consumed. No human being could bear the sight of God in his glory, as he is rather in himself. But just as though we cannot see the sun, we can see the sunshine. So though we cannot see God, we can see the glory of God, the outward shining of the inward being of God. So where do we see his glory? Well, we see it first in nature. The heavens declare the glory of God. The whole earth is full of his glory. We see the glory of God in the created order, in its beauty, in its intricacy, in its balance. But human beings have never been satisfied with the glory of God as seen in the created universe. Human beings have wanted to see more of the glory of God than we can ever see in nature. So Moses, in the first lesson that was read tonight, this was the reason I chose the lesson. Moses said, I beg you, God, show me your glory. Oh yes, there may be some glory in the heavens and on the earth, but I want to see more. Show me your glory. Have you ever said that? Do you want to see the glory of God? God said, well, you can never see my face and live. If you were to see my face, you'd wither up and die. But I will put you in a little place by me and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then you can see my back. 
You can see the afterglow. You can see the reflection. But you can never see my face. And then the prophets began to dream of the day when the Messiah would come and the Messianic age would be an age in which the glory of God would be revealed. That's why I chose the second lesson in Isaiah 40, which says the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. It's a prophecy of the coming of Jesus. So then Jesus came. The word the eternal word of God was made flesh, became a human being, and tabernacled among us, pitched his tent among us, and we beheld his glory. Now that reference to the tent or the tabernacle is probably a reference to what happened in the wilderness. Because when they built the tabernacle for those 40 years in the wilderness, there came a day when they'd finished the building that the glory of the Lord filled the tent. Just as in those days the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, so in the days of Jesus Christ, the glory of God filled him. He tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. True, nobody's ever seen God, verse 18. He is still invisible. If he were to appear and we were to see him, we would be consumed. But what we have seen in his glory, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And those who've ever seen Jesus Christ with the eye of faith, and their eyes have been opened to see the reality of Jesus Christ, have seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Jesus later in his public ministry dared to say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Paul said later on that he is the visible image of the invisible God. God is still invisible. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. We read at the beginning of the letter to the Hebrews, he is the effulgence of God's glory shining with the glory of God. And that was true all through his public ministry. You've read the Gospels, have you not? Have you not seen the glory of Jesus? We see it in his miracles. You know, in the next chapter too, after the first miracle was performed, the changing of the water into wine. Do you remember what John says? He writes, John 2 verse 11, this first sign did Jesus and manifested his glory. Not just because the miracles were signs of power, but because they were signs of the kingdom that he had inaugurated, signs of the new age. Not the new age that people are talking about today that isn't a new age at all, but the real new age which began when Jesus came into the world. And we see in the changing of the water into wine the replacement of Judaism by the gospel. And we saw his glory. And then we've seen his glory through the eyes of the evangelist throughout his public ministry. In that splendid combination of grace and truth, the graciousness and truthfulness shone from Jesus in all his words and in all his works. We see his glory as he fed the hungry and he healed the sick, as he honored women and as he welcomed little children and he made friends with the outcasts of society and he even touched untouchables. And he got on his hands and knees and he washed his disciples' feet. We see his glory in all that and above all we see his glory in the cross. If you know John's Gospel, you know that the full glorification of Jesus took place on the cross, in his sufferings, in the humiliation, and the self-giving, sacrificial love of the cross. It is there that his glory was chiefly revealed. As Calvin put it in his commentary on John's Gospel, the cross 
is like a splendid theater in which the glory of God is revealed. Friends, there has never been a brighter display of the glory of God as in the cross of shame. It's there we see his glory as his love and justice are reconciled. We see his implacable hostility to evil and his passionate love for evildoers like us. We have seen his glory in Christ. But then there's a second thing that I need to talk about for a few minutes, and that is we've not only seen his glory, but we have received his grace. Our relationship to Jesus Christ is not just a matter of seeing him, it's a matter of receiving something from him. Seeing and receiving go together. Seeing the glory and receiving the grace together indicate the kind of relationship that God intends us to have with Jesus Christ. And grace is another indispensable biblical word. Friend, you can't begin to understand the gospel or the Bible if you don't know the meaning of grace comes four times in these verses, grace after grace, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And if glory means the outward shining of the inward being of God, grace is the free and unmerited favor of God. In one word, grace is generosity. The grace of God is the generosity of God. Grace is God's gracious kindness to the undeserving. Grace is God taking the initiative, God coming to our rescue, pursuing us even to the cross. Grace is God stooping, God loving, God serving, God lifting, God taking the initiative. Grace, like glory, is seen most vividly at the cross. Well, for those of you who may like acronyms, it's been said that G-R-A-C-E stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. Or another acronym of grace is that it's God reaching after his creatures everywhere. And grace gives us what we do not begin to deserve. If only we put out a hand to receive it, grace will give it to us. Grace brings forgiveness, the expunging of our guilt and of a guilty conscience. Grace brings us peace with God and adoption into his family. Grace gives us a new life in the Holy Spirit and a share in the glory that will one day be revealed. These gifts of grace are only a beginning. John says, out of his fullness we have received, but we haven't received the fullness yet, only out of the fullness. And there is grace after grace after grace to follow. The whole Christian life is receiving more of his grace. Well, let me conclude. Seeing and receiving. Actually, as a matter of interest, isn't that what Christmas is all about on the secular plane? For one thing, it's seeing people that in many cases we haven't seen for the whole year. Families come together. There are happy reunions. People maybe we haven't seen for years. Oh yeah, we've corresponded with them, we've telephoned them, we've often thought about them, but at Christmas we see them. Christmas is all about seeing people we haven't seen for a long time, and it's about receiving the gifts they bring as a token of their love. Oh, I know some people give gifts because they must, as the boss at the office, you've got to give him a gift or her. There's old Aunt Agatha. We've been giving her gift every Christmas for 85 years. We can't stop now. You know, some people give because they've got to give, but most people give because they want to give. And we receive their gifts joyfully, not only because the gift in itself is precious, but because it's a precious token. 
of their love. We see them, and we receive their gifts. So this Christmas, as we see people and receive their gifts, I want to say to your friends, spare a thought for God. And ask yourself the question my text forces upon us, whether you've ever seen his glory in Jesus Christ, and whether you've ever received his grace in and through Jesus Christ. It's not a bad definition of what a Christian really is. A Christian is somebody who's seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and who has received his lavish grace in and through Jesus Christ. So I conclude, am I speaking to somebody tonight to whom God is remote, aloof, unreal, inaccessible, then listen, it's only Jesus Christ who can bring him near to you and bring you near to him. Open your eyes to see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Open your hand, turn it upwards, empty, to receive the grace that he offers to you, that supreme gift of salvation. We will rejoice together this Christmas as we say to ourselves and to one another and to God, we've seen his glory and we have received his grace. Let's pray. <coughs> We'll spend a moment in silent contemplation. Have we seen his glory? Have we received his grace? Our Heavenly Father, we worship you together this Christmas that you came to us in the person of your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, that you were made flesh, you became a real human being without ceasing to be God. We thank you that in Jesus Christ we've glimpsed your glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and we thank you that we've not only seen your glory, but received your grace, as in and through Christ you offer to us forgiveness, the gift of the Spirit, and a new life, and adoption into your family, and all these great blessings. Receive our worship and our thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dream.
Thank you for joining us. In just a second, we are going to watch a short trailer. That is for the online Christmas film that we've put together here at All Souls. And our hope is that that would be of real use to you wherever you're watching this around the world. The idea is that you can put on a carol service in your home, uh, in a local venue to you and invite all your friends that you can be with the All Souls Orchestra, with the All Souls Choir, um, with a Christmas message, you can be gathering your friends to watch that wherever you are. So first I'm going to lead us in a prayer. It's the Church of England prayer set for this Sunday in Advent. Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mary was that mother mild, Jesus. 